Welcome this Sunday morning on behalf of my wife and I and the leadership of the church. Welcome to Victory Outreach North Hollywood, 11 a.m. service. Praise the Lord. Come on now. There's no place that I would rather be on a Sunday morning. On a Sunday morning. Come on, I know the places that I used to be on a Sunday morning. You know, It's blessed to be in the house of the Lord where the Spirit of God is alive. Amen. And we just want to welcome you. Uh, we love you. And today we have a special, special service uh, planned for you. We have communion. We're going to take partake of communion this morning. It is very important. Jesus himself, in the word of God, he commanded his church. He says, man, after I'm gone, two things you have to practice. Water baptism and communion. Amen. And over 2,000 years later, the church of Jesus Christ is still uh, holding true to God's word. And practicing and keeping alive, amen. He tells the disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you, Jesus. How many are grateful this morning? Yes. Come on now. I can look out into this second service and I see many faces. Grateful. Grateful for what God has delivered us from. What God has brought us out of. What God has given us. We do not deserve Amen. Or am I the only one? Am I the only one that was a filthy animal before God came into my life? Thank you, men's home, for clapping because I know that I'm not the only one. And this is Victory Outreach, and I'll say this time again. The sisters were worse than the brothers. You know it's true. Praise the Lord, man. It's communion Sunday. We're going to have a blessed time today. Amen. And um, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today, Lord, and I pray that you would take full control, God, as we come together, your house, your children, God, to practice one of the sacraments, God, that you've given us, God, one of the commandments that you've given us as your church, Father. We come to lift up your name, to glorify you, God, as your word says, to do this in remembrance of you. I pray that you would remove me, hearts would be open, God, and that you would have your way, and we're careful to give you all the glory. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Communion is so important. So important as a Christian. And today, we're going to partake, amen. Communion, when properly observed, always gives force to the central truth of Christianity. Namely, the atonement. This is the heart of the Christian gospel. How many know what atonement means? I'm about to learn you something this morning. Atonement refers to the forgiving or the pardoning of sin through the death by crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Once this happened, once he died on the cross, once he paid the price, we were forgiven of sin. And once that happened, reconciliation was made possible. We are reconciled with God. And that's what took place when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The price was paid. And now we're in a place to be atoned for. You have been atoned for this morning. When Jesus went to the cross and he shed his blood on Calvary, he atoned for you. Amen. Now it is possible for you to be reconciled with God. Because before we accepted Christ, we were not reconciled with God. Can I get an amen? Matter of fact, some of us were far from God. I would even be so bold to say, some of you may have been the anti-Christ. Oh, come on now. Now, let me just make something clear this morning. There is no saving power in communion. Amen? It is a memorial. Do this in remembrance of me, the word of God says. When communion service is well conducted, it will preach the gospel of atonement more effectively and more beautifully than any sermon, no matter how eloquent the preacher may be. Christ loved to preach by pictures. That's why he gets the disciples in the, during the Last Supper and he grabs the bread and he says, this is my body. Jesus taught in pictures. It's amazing when he does that. You know that he's personal when he does that? When you open up his Bible and he begins to paint a picture to teach you a biblical truth, to teach you some truth from the kingdom of God, that when God paints these pictures, it's designed specifically for you. How cool is that, man? 
This is the divine artist's portrayal of the significance of his death, burial, and resurrection and his personal, personal visible return. The communion service provides, proclaims Christ as Savior, provider, life giver, intimate friend, and companion, inspirer, and Lord. And Lord, he lives and he will return. Because of his promised return, the inevitable triumph of Christ and his church is guaranteed. Jesus lives. Can I get an amen? If you believe that this morning, look to someone and say he lives. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, you got to do better than that, Victory Outreach North Hollywood. Do you believe that he lives? Then say he lives. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. If anyone should be grateful, come on, I have some of your mug shots. I got some of your throwback Thursdays with Aquanet and big old eyebrows that you can paint with a marker. Amen. Come on now. So Jesus gives the church, he gives the church two sacraments to practice. And the sacrament is a practice instituted by Christ himself. These are vitally important for the church and Christians to practice. And they should always be done with the word of God. And they, wait, and they should be done the way the word of God commands them to be done. Number one is baptism. Water baptism. And I'm going to give you just a quick overview on what baptism is. Baptism, Christ seals his name upon and calls to knife the person being baptized. It depicts the joining of the person to Christ. And it is an outward sign of the inward work of the Holy Spirit. And we will be doing water baptisms next month, so stay tuned. Uh, keep updated. We'll take sign-ups very soon, and we will be having water baptisms for those of you that never been. Amen. And the second was the Lord's Supper, communion, which we will be partaking of today. Christ gave the disciples the Lord's Supper. And although Jesus is not physically present in the Lord's Supper, even though Jesus is not physically present right now, he is spiritually present. And by eating the bread and drinking of the cup, as Christ commanded, the disciples, the Holy Spirit brings us into fellowship and communion with Christ, who is our salvation. The Bible reads in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, he was teaching the disciples. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus taught the disciples in the, in the Last Supper. Paul's teaching the Corinthian church in this book on how to properly partake of communion. And I'm going to give you, how do we partake of communion properly? Because the church at the time, remember last week I spoke on 1 uh, Corinthians, and we were speaking about the church, and it had many problems, and it had many problems because it was filled with, thank you for those that are paying attention this morning. Church has people. People have problems. So don't be surprised when you come to church and you see a bunch of people with, pro with problems. Amen. Because we're human beings. The church, had a, the church was a troubled church. It had many problems. And I don't want to get into the problems that it had. But Paul was trying to teach them. This is how you partake of commun communion properly. And this is something that we have to. We're, getting, we're going somewhere this morning. But this is something as a church. We've been I've been teaching a series on uh, spiritual maturity. But I have to stop. And we have to practice what God has given us. To practice the sacraments that he has given us. Because it's important and it's commanded to us by God in his word. We'll get back, to, we'll get back to, the, to the series next week. And you guys will love me again. Because the church has grown. We went from 10 people to over 100 people. We have our own building. But the reason that we've gone forward, right? The reason that we've gone forward is because we try to be sensitive when God says, okay, it's time to make a shift. Because what happens is God brings people. And all of a sudden, and this has happened, this has already happened a couple of times if you really pay attention to the church, God will bring people. But the people come and you have to teach them. They have to grow. 
They cannot stay the same. Imagine if I would still be the same from the first day I got saved. Or my first year of salvation, and I would be the same. And here I am serving the Lord for 12 years. I'd be a spiritual baby. So the, you have to shift the church, and the church has to grow. right? And we've made these shifts a couple of times already. And every time we make these shifts, every time we make these shifts, the Holy Spirit is challenging us to grow because we have to grow for the people that are coming. Right? And when you're challenged to grow, growing hurts. It requires stretching. Right? And, 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 and I'm going to be honest. Not everybody stays. I liked it before when you never challenged us. I liked it before when you never asked, when you, when you never made it like, you know. Because this is the beautiful thing about us. Because this is uh, how God is. Like, we never force anything on anybody. It's up to you. Right? Because God is a gentleman. I've learned that. Never force anything on anybody. You let them make the decision. Trust me, you'll sleep better at night. They can't blame you. But I have people come and say, man, pastor, man, we want to be a leader. We want to help because they see what God is doing. If you just got here a little while ago across the street, Urban Cafe, they just opened up. Right? They opened up. And, they, man, they said, hey, we want to bless you guys. And they came earlier and blessed everybody with lunch. It was, it, was, it was awesome. God has shown us favor. We have favor with our city councilmen. We have, uh, matter of fact, the senior lead officer of the area, he passed by earlier just to say hi. Let us know if you need anything uh, from, the, from the LAPD, the North Hollywood Division. They're like, hey, let us know if you need anything. Hey, man, just connecting. And God has shown us favor. Right? So people see what God is doing. Hey, bastard, we want to jump in. We want to be leaders. I said, okay, remember, you asked, you, you asked me. I didn't ask you. This is why you got to pay attention to the preaching because I, don't, I always preach it. I always preach it. You just kind of like have selective hearing when it comes to the preaching. Like, did you think you were just going to grab this without this? Especially if you want to say, hey, man, I think I'm ready to be used by God. Okay, then you're going to be challenged because God is not going to let you stay the same. And then what happens is you get challenged. You get challenged and then you realize, oh, I don't like that. I mean, so you're telling me I actually have to pray? Yeah. I actually got to live right? I can't, I can't. You got to stop. So you're telling me, yeah, you kind of have to show up. You got to show up. You, you can't be a leader in this church and never be here. Yeah. So that's what happens. The challenging takes place. And then you realize I had to change a heart. Maybe I shouldn't have. We have, a, we have a tendency of doing this as human beings, and I know I've done it myself, so I, I know it when I see it, is we have a tendency of putting our foot in our mouth. Yeah. Come on now. Making commitments that we had really no intentions of keeping. <laughs> but we'll get back to the spiritual maturity series later. I'm just giving you a little, a little, little taste of what the church has been going through this last couple of weeks. And people have been, I've been watching, I'm preaching my heart out, and I can see the squirm. Oh, God. oh stop it, Pastor! Tell me stop it. Because we're like a bus. I'm a bus driver. People get on, people get off. We keep rolling in the name of Jesus. But we're taking a break from that series because this is important. Commanded my God. This is special. Right? This is what Jesus told the church. He says, man, do this in remembrance of me. This is something that I want you to pass down from generation to generation to generation of believers. And Paul was talking to the Corinthian church. He says, look, man, you guys are, you guys are, 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 uh, you guys are a church. You guys are moving, but you guys got problems. So make sure when you take communion, you do it with the right heart. So he begins to explain. He says, well, how do you par uh, partake of communion properly? Number one, you got to have the proper elements, the bread. The bread was to represent the body of Christ that died on the cross for our sins. He suffered many abuses on his way to the cross. He suffered on the cross, and he gave his all for us. And that's what the bread represents, his body. Secondly, is you got to have the cup. And the cup was to represent the blood of Christ that he shed on the cross for our sins. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.22. Christ has shed, had to shed his blood for us. And I know, it's the cup. It is cranberry juice, right? Now, some of you like to sip on that wine, right? And, I, and, and usually I say some of us, but I don't drink. And I'm going to be honest. The Bible, when it comes to the Bible, technically, theologically, if you want to get into doctrine, 
The Bible doesn't say anything about drinking wine. It says you can drink wine. It just says don't get drunk. That's when you lose a lot of, lose a lot of people. Now, I don't do it because I understand where I came from, and I understand the role that alcohol played in my life. And because we're an inner city ministry, and most of the people that walk through our doors have some type of struggle, I don't partake because I don't want to be a stumbling block to my brother. I don't know who else. Some people, if you watch, uh, you ever watch The Simpsons? Remember that guy, Barney? Yeah. Yeah. Right? How he was, there was an episode where he was like a normal guy. He was a normal guy, college student, and then Homer gave him a beer, and it ruined his life. I don't know if you've ever seen that. But I'm not going to do that to people. Right? Some people, they don't have a problem with drinking. Praise the Lord for you. But my church, our church, God's church, Victory Outreach, I just choose not to because I don't want to be a stumbling block to my brother. And if you want, if you want to really make a deal about what well, we should be drinking real wine, then I'll pray you out and you go to a church that will let you drink wine in their service. But I just won't do it because... I, I take everyone into consideration. So I just have to throw that in there. Amen. Amen. And also, we must have a proper, we must have the proper attitude when partaking of communion. You have to examine yourself, right? And examine yourself from sin because sin will keep you from a right relationship with the Lord. If anybody who's ever backslidden, you understand. When you start to go in that direction, it hinders your relationship with God. God has promised to forgive us and restore us to proper fellowship with him. 1 John 1, 9, if we examine ourselves and we confess it, that's the beautiful thing about God is that you can repent and say, man, Lord, I want to get right with you today. I know, and you know when you allow certain things into your life, come on now, it places a wedge between you and God. You could be on fire for the Lord on fire, in love with Jesus, spending time with them. You love the worship, and all of a sudden, Something can creep in, and it may not even be sin, but it'll put a wedge between you and God because it takes your eye. It could be a job. Oh, come on, you know where I'm going. It could be a he or a she. And all of a sudden, what happened to your, what happened? I thought you loved the Lord. I do, but I'm just kind of like digging this other thing as well. Come on, somebody. But this is what God has given to the church. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And this is very, very important. Very important. And God wants us to do this and to practice this. We have to continue to, right? And we do this in remembrance of him. We take time. We take time. That's why I, 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 I think about Paul the Apostle and what made him a wise master builder. That rings with me. He said, God has given me the grace to be a wise master builder, an expert builder, right? And he says, I preach Christ and Christ crucified. I don't pretend to have all this knowledge. I preach Jesus and I preach that he died on the cross for our sins. But what made him a wise master builder? You know why? Because he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He walked with God and he was able to always keep Jesus the center, yet always help the people grow. If you look, he wrote, he wrote most, most of the New Testament. Look how he talked to the churches. He loved, he encouraged, he discipled, he dealt with, he corrected, he rebuked. All while keeping Jesus at the center. Keeping Jesus at the Don't ever take your eyes off Jesus. Don't ever get so busy doing that you take your eyes off God. Thinking. And I'm going to be honest with you because we're, we are a hardworking church. We're out there blessing people with food every week. We're out there putting in work in the sun. We're, man, we're taking people into our homes. We, 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 we're working with people, meeting with couples. We work hard for the Lord. But I always have to remember to keep my eyes on Jesus. The number one thing, to keep the number one thing, the number one thing. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the moment you take your eyes off Jesus, you start putting your eyes on everything else. And we live in a fallen world. We are born with sin. If you want to find something wrong, you will find it. Anywhere you look, I got to keep my eyes on Jesus. I have to keep my eyes on the Lord. Anytime I start to get negative or judgmental or cynical or complain, I said, Lord, please don't ever let me forget what you pulled me out of. Don't ever let me forget what you did on the cross for me that didn't even deserve it. If anything, 
I deserve the worst. I don't even deserve what you did for me. And if you ever watch the Passion of the Christ and you sit there and to see what actually happened and what transpired, if you read it in the Gospels, it's mind-blowing that he would go through all that for you. Gosh, it, 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 for me, it's a wake-up call. That's, this is why Jesus says, do this and teach him. Because it makes me kind of straighten up. It really makes me examine myself and says, man, God, I don't want to be ungrateful. I don't want to be ungrateful. I don't want, I don't want, I, I want my behavior to show that I actually care what you did for me. That I live in a, I live my, we're not perfect. I'm not talking about trying to be perfect. Right? That's why, that's why, that's why he says, examine yourself and repent. And make yourself get into that place with God. Amen. If you just live a life, like, look at David, a man after God's own heart, the Bible called him, made many mistakes. But if you notice, he never made the same mistake twice. And he made some big mistakes. But he, and he paid for his mistakes. Trust me. Whatever you do has consequence. It will have a consequence. David is a picture of that. Okay? But he always repented. Always repented. And the way that it was true repentance is he didn't make the same mistake again. Because if you keep making the same mistake, it's not repentance. But you're, just, you're just faking it, man. Your sorries are fake. You know? That's just what it becomes. But if you really spend time with the Lord, it says, man, God, I, I don't, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to do this. I don't want to be this way. And I believe days like today are beautiful because it realigns you back with Jesus. Because I, I know, man, I, I, I preach up here and I give it to you guys. Yeah. As I learned this, I, 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 I seen this, right? And this is heavy. I, I watched that, you know, on Netflix, they got the, that movie Stand and Deliver on there, right? And I watched it. And I've seen, I've seen it growing up as a kid because if you're, if you're a Hispanic kid from the city of L.A., they made you watch that when you were little, you know? I know all the scenes and all the words, right? I was like, that's us. All of those, you know, the all right, Richie, all those movies, right? You know them all. But it's a powerful statement made, right? When he says, man, you can't teach these kids because of where they came from and what they've been through and how they've grown up. You can't expect that of them. And, but he said, he, was, he, he, he spoke a powerful truth. He said, they will rise up to the level of expectation. And he says, all, all it takes is a right? All it takes is a will. So I've learned this, right? I've learned this. God has given me a big responsibility. My wife and I are in the leadership of this church. So we expect greatness. We expect greatness. We expect greatness. And you'll be surprised how people will rise up and blow your mind. You'll be like, what? He's serving the Lord? Yeah, he's on fire. What? They're still married? You know God's real. What? Are you kidding me? After all that that person has been through, there's, I can't believe they're not in a mental hospital. I can't believe after everything that person has been through, I can't believe they haven't just completely lost it, doing life in prison, or made all these bad decisions. Because we're living examples of what God can do. You know? That's why we challenge. Because you'd be surprised how people will respond. And I've seen it. I've seen it. We've been challenged. My wife and I were challenged, but we're just crazy enough to believe that what God says is true. What God says is true, and we challenge the church to grow. Be all that you can be. You can do it. Stop letting the devil lie to you. You can do it. It's not, you have the victory. It's not as hard as you think. It's because you let the devil lie to you, and you think, well, I can't do this, and I can't do that. What is the difference between you and I? What is the difference between if God used him, God could use us. If God used her, God could use you. You know what the difference is? Obedience. Just listen. Listen to God. But you can only hear God when you fellowship with him. And as we partake of communion, this is the beautiful thing, right? Because Jesus in the Last Supper, he was teaching them something. Just break this bread. Remembrance of what I did. Drink of this cup. And what happens when we do that as believers in remembrance of him, 
the Lord begins to fellowship in our hearts. And you're going to know what I'm talking about. Some of you, it's already happening in your hearts. But right now, when we get down and we start doing this right now, you're going to feel the Lord enter your heart and fellowship with you. No longer knocking, but coming in and sitting down and having a fellowship with you at the table. And it's a beautiful thing. When that happens in your life, and because and, 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 and you can't walk on water forever. Can I get an amen? But I also, the first time that that happened to me, and I actually fellowship with Jesus, my beginnings, I said, oh, man, that's what I've been looking for my entire life. The love that I never thought existed, I found it in God. The hope, the hope that I needed so bad in my life, the healing that I needed, that I brought, that I brought upon my own self with self-afflicted wounds. Some of us, we had no choice in our hurts, man. We were just, that was just what ended up happening. Some, you did some self-inflicted wounds. Right? Either way, when you sit at that table and he begins to heal you, and when you step away from that, you're like, oh my God, that was the most beautiful experience that I've ever had in my life. And you try your hardest. I will sit through preaching after preaching, correction after correction, rebuke after rebuke from the Holy Spirit. Because I realize that, that because of the fall of man, because of what Eve did, <laughs> love you sisters. I just, you know, once I, once I, I, sat, I had that fellowship with the Lord, I said, oh my God, that is what I want for the rest of my life. And from there, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. From there, everything else has been added to me. Everything. Everything. My wife was there. I put my, God first, and then my wife came, and then my kids came. Everything. It's biblical. It's on the word of God. will flow from there. will flow from there. But the problem with us is that we get impatient. And because we're go-getters and we'll make it happen. Come on now. This is Victory Outreach. Some of you had no money and you still partied all week long. You made it happen. You made it happen. How you still partying, bro? <laughs> you made it happen. All right? You made it happen. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to come and begin to... give you the bread and give up the cup and this is a special thing between you and the Lord between you and the Lord Thank you. next time when you put them like half because you got to be real careful it takes forever you don't need that much cranberry juice anyways Pass them out. <laughs> but they thought they were taking offering or something. We only take offering once. <laughs> they went into offering mode. Beautiful, handsome uh, men of God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is cool. You want to know why this is cool? Because it's commanded in the word of God. And when you do this, there's just something about knowing that I did what God asked me to do. Jesus asked me to do this, and I did it. You know? And there's something just beautiful of knowing that, like, I, I, I feel it like, man, I'm, I'm listening to my father. You know? And I feel like he's pleased. This is what I want you to do right now. Is I want you to take the bread. And we're going to say a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body. Thank you for what you did on the cross for me. Thank you, God. Thank you for paying a price that wasn't yours to pay that you thought of me when you went up on that cross. God, we remember, Lord. Bless it. At this time, we will partake of the bread.
take the cup. Father, this cup represents the blood that you shed. Your word says that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. You are the lamb without blemish, God. And we thank you for the shedding of your precious blood. Your blood that covers me. Your blood that covers our families, God. We don't ever want to take it for granted, Father. Thank you, Lord. Let us partake of the cup. Now what we're going to do is we're going to worship together. And as you partake of the bread and of the cup, you come into fellowship and communion with God. So I just want you to close your eyes right there where you're at. And we're going to worship Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.
voices, just the voices. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Oh, the blood. Come on, if he's been good to you, if he's been good to you, it washes white as snow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, if he's been good to you, I want you to worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Serving God. God is a personal God. And I say this all the time. The Bible says that each heart knows its own bitterness and no one else can share its joy. I don't know your lowest point. I don't know when you cried out to God, but I sure remember mine. I remember my lowest point. I remember when I looked up and I said, man, God, I need help. I don't want to, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm beat up. I'm all jacked up emotionally. I need healing, God. I need to believe in something, God. I believe it's got to get better, God. I know you're up there, God. I thank you, Jesus. I got to stay grateful. I got to stay grateful. I can't let the devil lie to me, man. I got to push forward. I got to keep going. The Bible says you need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Develop a relationship with God. You and God. You and God. So that we know what? When the devil comes to lie to you, because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, you have a foundation. You have backbone. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm pushing forward. That's why communion is so powerful. Communion is so powerful. I, I can just take my eyes off for one second for growing, teaching, learning. Just put my eyes on God. And when, and when it's just me and him at the table, I can't even. I can't even. I just, I can't. I have just no words. I just start weeping. You know, and he's so gentle and loving. It's like, it's all right, mijo. I love you. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. I love you. It's, it's, it, I love you, daughter. I love you, son. We're going to make it. It'll be all right. Yeah. That's why it's so important that we, do, we, take, we partake of communion and, and water baptisms, that we do what the Lord has called us to do. Next week, I'll whoop you. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. But we're going to grow together. Amen. I, you guys grow me too. But thank you, Jesus. So what I'm going to do is we're going to close like this. Um, if you're watching online or if you're here this morning, uh, if you've never accepted the Lord into your life, we're going to give you an opportunity. You just won the lottery. Amen. You're about to be blessed. You're about to be blessed. And all it takes is a simple prayer. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe that he died on the cross for your sins, and that he rose from the graves. He conquered death. That if you believe that and you say that prayer, that you shall be saved. That's how it all started. That's how it started for all of us. With a prayer. With a prayer. And everything changed. 
Amen. And we're going to give you that opportunity this morning. It's simple. Just repeat after me if you're watching online too. Father, we come before you today, Lord. And we thank you for what you did on the cross, Father. We believe in you, God. We believe that you are the Son of God, Jesus. We ask you to be our personal Lord and Savior. I ask you, God, to come into my heart. I know, God, that I'm a sinner. I'm asking for your help, Lord. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose from the grave. I believe that you live. I ask you to lead me in this life, God. I want to fellowship with you, God. I walk with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And the amen. Praise the Lord. It's powerful. It's powerful. You really, uh, man, I, I felt like when I partook of the bread and I drank of the cup and we began to worship, I could feel that fellowship with the Lord. I could feel that communion with the Lord. Amen. That's why we remember. We do it in remembrance of him. With that, God bless you, church. Another great Sunday. We will see you next week. Thank you.